Bojo, welcome to WAS Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I am the teacher, Bronwyn Slade. If you'd like to participate live today, you're welcome to call the WASA studio at 1-800-465-7144 and also at 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM and on the television at Bell Express View channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. I'm just gonna run through how to join with the Zoom link in case you haven't done that before. So you click just on the link that you get from me or your DEC to join the class. It is the same link for every one of our classes. So you don't need a new link per for every day. Uh, it's the same one that it always works. So just bookmark that or save that link. Then once you click, it's going to say join with computer audio so that you can hear. Um, so you click on that blue button and uh, then you're going to get a message that says this class will be recorded. Uh, it's also will tell you, I think, that uh, it is being broadcast live through YouTube. It's not actually being broadcast live because I set it to a private setting, but I am recording it and will be posting it up to YouTube uh, as well. That's why um, part of why we recorded it so that I can put it up on YouTube so that folks can access it at a later date. So click yes or I got it um, just to consent that it's okay for that to be going on that you don't mind joining it. If you prefer not to, then uh, you can end the course or the class sorry, the Zoom message, uh, meeting, and then you can watch the replay on YouTube if that is more comfortable for you. On the bottom left side of your screen, that's where the microphone and the video are options. So you can, my microphone is on right now, so it's not muted. Um, so it doesn't have a red line through it, but I ask you to, to mute yourself so that we don't hear any background noises. Um, and I ask you also to keep your video off. Um, if you would really, really like to have your video on, you can, but I keep my video off to keep, just keep things a little bit cleaner and easier to focus on the coursework. Also, because I am recording it and uploading it to YouTube, that just keeps um, things private for yourself. So really, if you're joining it to watch the class, um, keeping yourself muted and your video off means that no one, when I do upload it, no one will know that you were there. Um, or none of your personal identity will be broadcast with it. If you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, that is totally okay. Um, yeah, and then I just ask you to mute yourself again once you are um, done with your question. Then to leave the class over here on the bottom right of the screen is an end button. You click here to uh, leave. If you click there by accident and you want to rejoin the class, that's totally fine. You won't have any problems to do that. Just click back on the link and um, go start up again. No worries. Uh, if you do need to step away from your computer, it is fine to just step away because you're muted and your video is off. There's no way for us to know that you stepped away. Um, so you won't be disturbing the computer if you need to deal with the rest of your life. Um, that is completely reasonable and understanded. So you don't have to leave the class and then join back in. Um, unless you want to, you figure out what works best for you. I have the subtitles turned on for Zoom in order to make the course more accessible. Um, you can decide if you want to see them or not. So if you click, go down here to there's a more button at the bottom of your screen. There also might be a live transcript button um, in here, depending on how big your screen is. So you click on it and then you can either hide subtitles or show subtitles depending on what is best for you. You can also ask me for a copy of the live transcripts if you want. It doesn't always understand what I'm saying. I'm working on speaking slower and being more articulate, but it uh, doesn't always pick up exactly what I'm saying properly. So we do our best. So you decide what's best for you. All right, so I also want to go over what the difference between the radio zoom course is and the IL course as um, that might not have been super clear and just to clarify at this point. So first, how are they the same? 
the course materials, the evaluations, and the resources are all the same. So it doesn't matter if you're in, registered in the radio Zoom class or the IELTS class, you are getting the same course, you get, are getting the same support, um, the same resources. One is not better than the other in terms of that. One is not easier than the other. Um, it is the same. It is exactly the same. Also, anyone can listen and participate in the radio Zoom classes. Even if you are registered in the IELTS course, you are welcome to join us for the radio Zoom classes, either live or accessing them on YouTube afterwards. So I, as I said, I upload them to YouTube and I put in show notes, I connect to the materials, um, any extra resources or videos that we've played in class, um, that's all there posted on YouTube. So everybody has access to that no matter what um, pathway they are registered in. So then how they're different is just really the schedule. So a radio Zoom has a, is scheduled over four different terms in the year. Um, each of the classes run for nine weeks in one of those four terms. And during those sessions, I am here live, explaining the course concept, showing examples, talking through all of the, uh, I think there's, sorry, 23 lessons in this one, not just 20. Um, but so we work through all of the lessons. Uh, together. The IELTS courses are open to start and finish in the course anytime. So you can start now as of September 6th, you can start the IELTS course and you can finish it anytime between now and June 16th, 2023. Um, the radio Zoom class, you're kind of expected to finish it within the term, though if need be, we can roll you over into the IELTS um, registration so that you can continue on until the end of June or the middle of June. And that's really how they only are different. So our classes are scheduled from Monday through Thursday from 10 to 11 in the morning um, on those four days. Friday, we don't have any classes. Um, there might be a catch up class, but it's time for you to do your work. Reach out to me. I will try to reach out to you. Um, but our classes are live on the radio from Monday through Thursday um, from 10 to 11. And we are in our first week of our nine week course. So this is our first day and our class runs from today, September 6th to November 4th is when uh, the last week of our class. So though you probably don't have any work to submit for marking yet, it's important to know what you will be expected to submit so that you can be prepared. There are key questions in your aisle units that um, we set out. These are all the questions you submit for marking. So they have a key icon that lists which questions to do. So please do all of them. Some of them are found under the check your understanding. Some of them are activities, some of them review questions. Um, so please complete all of those questions in order to get all the maximize of your um, understanding and your grade. Please show all of your work, your any of your steps and your thinking really make sure you're giving me a complete answer um, and that you're actually answering the question that's being asked. Um, really give me as much information as you can and useful sentences really explain well so that I can understand what it is that you understand. You are welcome to do this by hand or electronically. If you want to uh, write in your workbook, you can, but the spaces are pretty small. And so I would encourage you not to just because that's pretty cramped. Um, but if you want to write it out by hand and send me by hand, that's totally fine. Um, if you want to do it electronically, Word and Google Doc files are the easiest ones for me to access. Everyone has access to Google Docs through their NNEC email address. And if you need support to figure out how to do that, feel free to um, reach out and I can walk you through how to use those. Um, if you need to use a different kind of file, that's probably fine. Just reach out so that we can make sure that I can access yours. I don't want your uh, work to get lost because I can't open your file for some reason. Okay, so then how do you actually submit your work now that you've got it all done? So if you've done it by hand, you can scan it um, and then send electronically is the first method. So if you're using, uh, if you have an Apple device, you can use the notes app to scan if you don't have a scanner, many of us don't. Um, or if you have an Android device, then you can use the Google Drive app. Both are free apps that generally come with those devices um, and they have fairly straightforward scan functions um, that just sort of make it a little bit easier to read your work. 
And you can send it through email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Or you can also send it to me through Facebook Messenger where I'm found at bslatewasa. Both options are totally fine. Uh, just a reason why I suggest to scan your work instead of taking a picture. Um, if you scan it with an app on your phone or a device, it means that it's easier to create one file with all the pages. It's faster because it simplifies the image and it's a smaller file, which means that it's easier to send. Taking a picture is totally fine. I can um, most likely, I can deal with it. Many students have taken pictures, but just if you are able to scan it, it just makes it a little bit of an easier, um, makes life a little bit easier. If you can't, no worries. Uh, if you do want to learn with your smartphone or device, then let me know and I can help you learn how to do that. Okay, so then the second method is to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout. Uh, we have an outdoor memorial box at our location 74 Front Street. We're the bright red building next to the post office and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. We are not yet open to the public. So for now, if you're in town, just drop it off there and then I'll get it and get it back to you as soon as I can. Um, hopefully we will be opening to the public soon so that you can actually come in and chat with me or do work in our student space um, or hand your work into us directly, but we're not there yet. So for now, just pop it into the mailbox if you are in town. The third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7858. Also, um, students can fax as well, but um, that's fine if you have access to a fax machine. Again, many of us don't. If you'd like to connect with me on uh, social media, both my Facebook and my YouTube are under the name B Slate Wasa. So you can find me there. You can find me on Facebook. I'll probably reach out if you have Facebook, if I can find you as well. So we can connect there. I chat with many students through Messenger um, is a great way to connect. Um, and if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, then you'll get notifications when I upload any of our uh, science courses, our videos. So then you can just really easily access those uh, if you need to go back and review any information. Again, all of our radios and classes are recorded and posted to YouTube. I have them under a playlist called SVN3E and I share them on Facebook. There's also an archive of lessons from previous, from last year. Um, so you can go back and if you want to move faster than we're moving in the course, you can go back there. However, there were some glitches with some sound and some technology issues that I didn't realize until the end of the course. So those videos are probably not the best videos um, to watch, but you are totally welcome to if you want to. And then any glitches that were happening, just skip through that time. Um, and, but there, as I put new lessons up, they will be there as well so that you can access, hopefully my recordings have less glitches this time around. Science is a really visual subject. I believe all learning is important to access both visual and audio pieces. Um, so I strongly encourage you to connect with the YouTube videos or join me live through Zoom. If you don't have reliable internet and that's not an option for you, that's completely understandable. I know that's something that many folks struggle with. But if you reach out to me, I can send you a copy of the recordings so that you can still have access to the, the full experience of the course instead of just listening to it on the radio. Then you can maybe go to your learning center or access it somewhere else, your computer. Um, if that's not connected to the internet and that's totally fine, then you still get the full, uh, the full experience. So let me know if you need that support. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me. This is why I'm here. I am your teacher. My job 100% is to support you however you need it. I will reach out to connect with you, but I have lots of students and you just maybe have a couple of teachers if you don't just have one, if it's not just me. Um, so please reach out if you need support. I am willing to work with you however I can to really support you. Um, but 
I don't necessarily know that you need that unless you reach out. So my email is a great way to get me. My email address is bronwyn.slate and that's spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. Connecting with me through Facebook is great as well. B Slate Wasa is my name there. Calling me at the office is 807-737-1488 and my extension is 2209. I teach during from 10 to 11, so that's not a great time to reach me. If you need to leave me a message, then I'll get back to you. Um, but totally, you're welcome to call. Also, you can call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. But like I said, I teach from 10 to 11. Um, so calling me during that time, you won't get me. But otherwise, I'm here and generally at my desk working away. So you can call me and connect if you need to. If those that timeline doesn't work um, for you, if you reach out to me, maybe we can connect another time and set up another time to connect if that's what you need. All right. So I think it's really important to position myself as an educator, particularly within science, as uh, that has who I am. My experience in life has shaped how I understand science and how I teach this course. Um, and I don't necessarily get it all right all the time. So I like to share my positionality in our course just to make sure that, uh, to be honest about who I am and where I come from. So first, me as your teacher, I have white settler ancestry. Um, I have white privilege and that shapes my experience as an educator and also as a learner. Um, there are certain things that were easier for me throughout the education system because I am white and I recognize that and I tr am working towards uh, disrupting that cycle um, within our education institutions. I do live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Honest Number people and I work to honor their teachings and their knowledge and integrate what I can as an outsider um, into our course as, as we learn about science. Um, as Overall, as an educator, I have lots to learn and unlearn. So there's, uh, I have lots to teach and give, but uh, as a part of this system, there's always new things for me to learn and how to do better and old practices that I need to unlearn. Um, and it is a process, it's, it's a journey. It's not something that I probably other will get 100%, but it is something that I'm working towards in order to make our my courses more accessible and inclusive and to confront uh, systems of oppression that are deeply ingrained within our education um, in Ontario that I believe. Also, our textbook, we need to talk about that position because that is written from one point of view. Um, I find that it is very Eurocentric. So it really focuses on the experiences of white people, people from, with European, with white settler ancestry. Um, those communities are talked about, uh, those scientists are talked about, and it, it frustrates me. I have not yet found a better resource. It is something that I'm working on. If anybody knows of anything, feel free to reach out and let me know so that I can work on something that is a bit more authentic to the realities of different experiences and different peoples and not just focusing on one perspective on one Eurocentric perspective, which is totally problematic. Uh, particularly, I, I realize that it ignores Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis knowledges and experiences. There's a few examples, but uh, it really doesn't meet the full needs that I think that it should. Um, and it might have a few examples of experiences, but really does not honor the knowledges that I know are rich within these communities. It's something, again, that I am working towards integrating into the course, but as an outsider, I don't have a full knowledge um, and it is a bit of a process, something that I will continue to work on and uh, welcome any suggestions that other folks might have if they'd be willing to share with me and that feels like a good idea for them. Um, I'm welcoming that conversation in order to make this a richer and more authentic course. Okay, so today we're going to be just looking at an introduction of what this course is before we dive too deeply into the actual course material, um, just because environmental science uh, 
what does that even mean? So today's class, as I said, is an intro. It's before the workbook material and assignments. So this isn't going to line up exactly with uh, that I'm going to be talking on certain pages or anything. We're just going to sort of have an overview of understanding what this course is about and where we're going um, throughout our nine weeks together. So our learning goals of today are that at the end of this lesson, you will be able to explain what is involved in the study of environmental science, and you will understand the impacts of human behavior and the challenges that we face. So let's explore these ideas. So environmental science, by definition, is the study of the interaction of the living and non-living components of the environment with special emphasis on the impact of humans on these components. So it's not just looking at the environment, but it's looking about how humans impact it and how that has a greater effect overall, how that has a ripple effect, how that, what, how that shapes things and affects both the living and non-living components of the environment outside of just the human experience. So how and then it's, but it's also about how the environment impacts humans because then that ripple effects about how we respond and impact the environment back again. So it has applied goals. So it's developing solutions to environmental problems. We're not just looking at that, how we impact things, but we also want to look at how we can maybe make changes and have a less of an impact or have a more of a positive impact. It's also an interdisciplinary field. So it connects a lot of different things. So it connects natural sciences. So the information about the world, which is the like biology, chemistry, uh, atmospheric science, oceanography, geology, all of those like physical things that are actually tangible that we can touch. Um, and then also the social sciences, which are the values in hu human behavior. So the uh, politics, the economy, ethics, engineering, history, sociology, all of those sorts of things are connected. We bring all of those bits, pieces together um, to form environmental science. So it's sort of a cross between a physical science and a social science, um, which is pretty cool to see it all interconnected and how it all works together. So first we need to sort of talk about, well, what do we mean about environment? So it's the total of our surroundings all the things around us with which we interact or interact without us. So it's the living things. So the animals, plants, forests, fungi, et cetera, all of those things that grow and uh, change. The non-living -living things. So the continents, the clouds, the oceans, the soil, the rocks, all of those physical tangible things that are not living, breathing things. They're also our built environment. So buildings, human center, human created living centers, things that we create and uh, take up space, as well as the social relationships and institutions. So it's those physical things, but also the uh, interactions and the beliefs and the value systems that we as a social creatures create and uh, project onto our environments, onto the spaces around us. So the, we're going to talk a lot about natural resources. So these are the substances and energy sources that are needed for survival, particularly our survival. Uh, we have renewable resources, which are perpetually available. So sunlight, wind, wave, geothermal, these are all energy resources that uh, we cannot use up, um, that are always available. They always are I mean, we have the sun hasn't burnt out yet, so we're good to go. That is not a concern. There isn't, we can't use up too much sunlight and the, we're, we can't use up the sun in order for it to burn out. We can't use up the wind and then there will never be any wind again. These things continue to happen and we harness the energy that they create. Um, then we also have renewable, or so one, another set of renewable resources are the ones that renew themselves over short periods of time. So we often think of timber, water, uh, soil as renewable resources, and they are, but we need to give them time to renew. So we can't just cut down all the trees and then be like, okay, you're a renewable resource, just 
instantly going to have more timber. No, it takes time for those trees to regrow. We think about old growth forests. So there were trees that took thousands of years and we when we cut them down, then it's going to take thousands of years for trees to grow of that size and health again. Um, so they are renewable, but we do need to be cautious and careful about how we use them in order to give them time and space to renew. And they can be destroyed. We can use them all up and they cannot regrow if we completely take them out. If we make them extinct, if we wipe them out, then they will be gone forever if we are not careful. And then there's the non-renewable resources. So these are things like oil, coal, minerals. These are things that we extract from the earth generally um, and take like millions of years to develop. So that isn't something that uh, will ever within the human's time span are gonna be able to get back. So the, the coal, the oil that we extract from the earth is from uh, organic material from millions of years ago that has been compressed and turned into these resources that we now tap in and to and use but we use them at such a fast rate that there's it's just not possible for them to uh, replenish because it takes millions of years and we have not been here for millions of years and they can be depleted and they are on a pathway as we've been has as our society has been talking about over the last couple of decades about how concerning it is the rate in which we're using these resources and that we are wiping them out and they will no longer be here. There's nothing we can do about it. So that's what the environment is. So then what is human impact? So global human population growth is the, how many people there are. So right now we have more than 7.9 billion humans on the earth. So just our existence is an impact on the earth. And a lot of that growth has happened very, very recently. So we, on this graph that I have shown, we have years before present. So 10,000 years before present, uh, there was an agricultural revolution, so people started to uh, use agriculture and grow more food. And so then uh, things started to, our population started to increase because we were, had more access to reliable food sources. And so great, but then uh, in the last hundred years, um, we had the industrial Re revolution and so that our population has skyrocketed to go from under, like we had for thousands of years, we had under uh, 500,000 people on the earth as a whole. And in the last 100 years, we have skyrocketed up to over uh, 7. Point billion, 7.9 billion humans. Um, so that has had a huge impact on our earth and what is sustainable and what are we able to, how we use those resources. So why do we have so many humans? So we had that agricultural revolution. So we had stable food supplies that started. And then we had the industrial revolution, which is when we urbanized societal power by fossil fuels. We had developed sanitation and medicines. We had more food. So these are not bad things. Great. We had people who are living longer, people who are healthier. Um, but it just means that our population has skyrocketed. We, have, we can't be living the same way that uh, we were before we were using all of these resources. So the human growth has exasperated all of our environmental problems. We take up so much space, we really impact our environment. So our growth rate has slowed, but we still add more than 200,000 people to the planet each day. And we are completely dependent on the environment for our survival. So we are still adding more and more people to the planet and expecting that we're just all gonna be okay. Life has become more pleasant for all of us so far, which is great. So we have increased wealth, health, mobility, leisure time, but our natural systems have been degraded and environmental changes threaten long-term health and survival. So if we are not cautious, if we are not thinking critically and sustainably and 
being aware of the impact that we were having on the earth then this uh pleasant life that we've created for ourselves is going to end because we are using up all of the resources and it's just not sustainable for the number of people that exist so we're gonna talk about ecological footprints which is just a thought about how much impact environment impact each person or population has on the environment um, so it's the amount of biological productive land plus water for raw materials and to dispose and recycle our waste so how much stuff we use and how we what happens to the stuff that we when we have waste so generally we have overshot so humans have surpassed the earth's capacity we're using 30 percent more of the planet's resources than are available on a sustainable basis so that is what we're talking about when we're talking about not being able to continue the way that we are living is that we are already using up our resources but more than they can replenish more than they can survive also not all of our ecological footprints are equal so it varies greatly from countries to country it also varies greatly within country between those who are live in poverty and those who are wealthy so for example the u.s footprint is almost five times greater than the world's average. So this is the world average, about 2.2 hectares. Um, and the United States is 9.6 hectares. Canada's is 7.6 hectares. So not as big as the US, but still fairly large um, in comparison to the rest of the world. Developing countries generally have much smaller footprints than developed countries. Um, and we're gonna talk more about this environmental injustice later in the course. So then what are the environmental impacts? So we face challenges in agriculture. So we have expanded food production has led to increased population and consumption. It's one of humanity's greatest achievements, but it's an environment, an enormous environmental cost. So it's great that we're able to grow our survivor food and spread it out all over the world. But it means that we have really impacted the environment because of that. Nearly half of the planet's land surface is used for agriculture. So this means that those that amount of land is influenced by chemical and fertilizers, pesticides, erosion, changes in the natural system because they're used for farming. Um, so this is the kind of impact that we have. We also have changes, face challenges in pollution. So the waste products and artificial chemicals used in farms, industries and households impacts the earth. Each year, millions of people die from pollution. We face challenges in climate. So scientists have firmly concluded that humans are changing the composition of the atmosphere. The Earth's surface is warming. So this means that we are melting our glaciers. Our sea levels are rising. This impacts wildlife and crops. And we're having increasingly destructive weather, um, which hopefully is a, uh, obvious it's not just about the earth getting warmer if you think about the amount of snow and the cold that we had last year in Sioux Lookout and in various northern communities um, this is all a result of climate change as systems are changing so since the industrial revolution atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations has risen by 37 percent to the highest levels in 650,000 years so we're going to look more into what that means and the impact of that. Then we are also facing changes in biodiversity. So human actions have driven many species extinct and biodiversity is declining dramatically. So we are getting less and less diverse plants and animals, insects, and that affects has a ripple effect. Biodiversity loss may be our biggest environmental problem. Once a species is extinct, it is gone forever. We cannot bring them back. So our energy choices will affect our future. The lives we live today are due to fossil fuels, machines, chemicals, transportation products, all of this are based on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are a one time bonzana. supplies will certainly decline. So we only have them. And once they're gone, they're gone. We've used up half of the world's oil supplies, how we handle this imminent fossil fuel shortage. We need to change the way that we are living in order to survive. We can't just use it all up and then be like, now what? So then the question is, well, isn't this solution obvious? Don't we just stop? So let's look at that a little bit more. So what is an environmental problem? So 
the perception of what constitutes a problem varies between individuals and societies. So for example, DDT is a pesticide. In places with malaria carrying mosquitoes is welcome because it kills the mosquitoes. So here's a picture of uh, probably in the 50s or so um, where chemicals are being sprayed directly onto children um, to protect them from insects and things that had diseases. It made sense at the time. So currently in the world, DDT helps because malaria, which is carried through mosquitoes, it kills them, which means that people are protected. But in places where malaria isn't a concern, like Canada, we, DDT is not okay. We don't welcome it, it is banned um, because there are other health risks. And so this changes over time and it changes depending on where you are and your different challenges. So we can't just say, well, DDT shouldn't be used anywhere in the world because it has benefits, it helps in some places in the world. Um, and so this isn't something that we can just blanket statement um, for everywhere because every country, every individual has different needs. So then this part is it gets to be a little bit tricky. So environmental science is not environmentalism. So environmental science is the pursuit of knowledge about the natural world. Scientists try to remain objective, whereas environmentalism is a social movement dedicated to protecting the natural world. Now, I would argue that scientists, that it's impossible for anybody to be objective. Um, you choose the facts that you're presenting, you choose the way that you present them. It's, there's no way for our bias to be outside of ourselves. We are always going to bring that with us. Um, but this is the, the textbook sort of way of talking about it. There are similar solutions that do exist in our world. So we must develop solutions that protect both our quality of life and the environment. So we, there is organic agriculture, there's technology that reduces pollution, there's biodiversity that we can protect species, there's waste disposal, recycling. We're gonna talk more about all of these things throughout the course in terms of what is the most effective ways of doing these sorts of things. And there's alternative fuels. So sustainability is the goal for the future. Again, uh, my bias is coming through. I think that this is the way that we go. So this is why I don't believe that anything can be subjective or objective. So how can humans live without within the planet's means? So sustainability leaves future generations with a rich and full earth. We conserve the earth's natural resources and we maintain fully functioning ecological systems. Sustainable development, the use of resources to satisfy current needs without compromising future availability of resources. So this is why I think that it is using, thinking about what our current needs are, but also thinking about the future and generations to come. So with the, the idea of this triple bottom line of sustainable solutions that we want them to meet both environmental goals, economic goals, and social goals. It requires that humans apply knowledge from the sciences to limit environmental impacts and maintain functioning ecological systems. So environmental science helps us understand our relationships with the environment and informs our attempts to solve and prevent problems. Solving environmental problems can move us forward towards health, longevity, peace, and prosperity. Environmental science can help us find balanced solutions to environmental problems. So I wanted to look at how this all relates to you in terms of, this is a lot of talk, but what does that really mean? And I wanted to look at the case study of grassy narrows. So we're gonna watch a six minutes or so video um, about this, that gives a little bit of a story of Grassy Narrows in terms of this context of uh, environmental injustice, sort of. Um, and there's more rich, not more rich diversity and stories from Grassy Narrows, not just this one story. Um, but this is the story of mercury poisoning within Grassy Narrows and um, how that came about a little bit and the impacts overall in terms of that environmental impact from the humans impacts and how that's overall and impacted other folks as well. So let's watch this and then we'll chat a little bit about it. 
Raphael Forbister. Hello, my name is Shoes Bruce. Darren Forbister. Judy De Silva. I am from Grassy Narrows. I'm poisoned by mercury and I am a mother of five. We have stomach problems if we try to drink the water. It's already killing us slowly. It's a struggle every day to not have clean drinking water. If we run out, then uh, we have to wait until further deliveries come in. It's been years. Why hasn't anything happened? I'm Chief uh, Simon Forbister, uh, Surgeon Clam. Um, Grassy Narrows, and we have 800 members uh, that don't have access to, to safe drinking water. This is our Grassy Narrows First Nations standpipe. This is the water that gives pressure and delivers water to the community members. The water in there is Not safe. People are really resilient. They're very strong people. Like this thing, 2002 and 2016, the logging trucks still have not driven through here. So like it shows our people how they are so strong in what they believe in. The mercury issue started in 1975 when they, we discovered the fish were dying. Our people are a river people. Historically, they lived from the water. When we found out the mercury was in the water, it, it had a really devastating effect in our community, economically, socially, and all that. It's like a genocide of our people. A lot of our people have died from the mercury poisoning, and still today they are. ALS was on the rise, uh, Alzheimer's, MS, Parkinson's, and cancers were, are really prevalent today as a result of the water situation. Nothing happened to me personally because I always buy lots of water bottles. It's costing me money to actually drink water and that shouldn't be happening when I'm at home. We have a water place in our reserve. Um, they give out water to each and one of us, a water jug. But if we run out, it's a disaster. Like we're pretty much, we don't have a date. So when the water guy brings water, we have all our empties that we're collecting. So we trade full water jugs for our empty jugs, and that's how we that's how we get our water. We actually buying it from Kenora. The poor people they are very desperate when they they run out of water because they can't afford to go into town to get water. I could see it in them today when they're coming to get the water, how desperate they were, like, there's no water. We should be drinking for our, from our taps, not the water jugs. That's not normal. So here, these are our filters. Uh, these, this is our baffles. At this moment, um, our water system is sending out some chemical in, the wo in our treated water due to the lack of upgrades we need here. It's hard to imagine something we cherish and honor for the last 10,000 10, 10, years can turn against us. But it's the industrial nations that have changed that. 
industry is given too much free reign on our lands to put their pollutants out there and their chemicals and and they need to put water first. It's a very basic human right that we need to have that access to good, clean drinking water. Hydro development and industrial development have contributed to poor quality of uh, drinking water, even in the river system. As you know, uh, um, Dryden paper dump, they say about 12 tons of methylmercury into the river system. Sometimes the racism has to be put aside, that it's not just an indigenous problem, it's a human problem. Justin Trudeau, pretty sure I speak for everyone. We need your help. We need the fresh water. Because without fresh water, there's no life. So this video, I believe, was made in... 2006 is the, is the year that comes to mind, but that seems too long ago. I don't remember now. Um, sorry, I'll... Maybe it was 2016? Anyway. Uh, there's been lots of conversation about grass scenarios, and there are more recent articles um, posted. So I will link these in the show notes so you can look at them if you'd like to uh, look at them a little bit more. But uh, this one is from July 2021. So this is a year ago. Uh, and Grassy Narrows funding packed for mercury poisoning care homes spurs joy and bitter memories. So the federal government promised, I think it's $69 million in funding to provide long care services and care and services at a treatment center um, for the people of Grass and Arrows who are suffering from mercury poisoning. So it's targeted to open in 2023. I don't know um, how that is going. Maybe folks um, in Grass and Arrows might be able to share that with us. Um, but it's still frustrating because in the, it was in the 60s and the 70s when dr the Dryden paper mill dumped the mercury into the river, into the English Wabagoon River. And so this is like 60 years later that, um, between 50 and 60 years later that things are actually being addressed and maybe they're like that's a long time for a community to be fighting for something um but there's also another one that i'm sharing from september 2021 which talks about the the science um so a it's called ignored for too long study showing effects of mercury on mortality in grassy narrows wins award so this would be an example of environmental science um, actually having a impact on the community, on um, people's lives, because the things were measured and tracked and studied and were able to show the impact that this mercury was having on this community that was a direct result of the mercury levels being elevated due to the paper mill in Dryden dumping mercury into the river. So it shows just in terms of the, how this is relevant to our lives that this has a direct impact on people's lives. And here's another study um, from March, 2022. So this past year, a new study adds to body of proof connecting mercury poisoning to health issues in grassy narrows. So these studies are the actions that the people of Grass and Arrows, they're advocating, they're fighting for to be acknowledged. These studies are helping their cause in terms of being recognized and getting the support that they deserve. Um, it doesn't fix the situation. It doesn't erase the impact that 
this has had on these people and this community and the environment in this area. Um, but it is a start in terms of hopefully things like this not never happening again. Um, and these people getting some compensation to be able to improve their lives. Ah, sorry, I didn't mean to click there. So then I have another video that just shows a um, protest that happened uh, this year. And I'm going to, uh, I'll link that in our show notes because we're running out of time. Um, it's just about a two or three minute video, but um, about a protest that it was covered this year. So you can look at that in terms of the action that folks are taking. But I wanted to, instead, I'm going to play part of this other video that I have, which is, um, not directly science-based, but it is a music video that Youth in Grassy Narrows created um, there with an uh, organization that goes into communities and does this type of work to give the voices, to elevate the voices of youth in these communities, to just really show that these are not hopeless people. These people are strong and um, just to recognize that in terms of their story not only being um, about being taken advantage of, being poisoned, um, but to recognize the power that are these community, um, these all of these indigenous communities have. Um, I wanted to end on that sort of note in terms of knowledge is power and how the impacts have of learning about the science stuff, learning about these environmental issues will improve the lives of these youth and these youth are fighting and demanding it. Um, I wanted to share this video home to me uh, with everyone.
All right, so unfortunately we are out of time, so we can't watch the whole video, but again, I'll link that in our show notes uh, so you can see that powerful video of the youth aggressing arrows really making space their own and really acknowledging what they care about and that they are there and that that's important. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and contact me. Um, you can call me at the office at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or email me at bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Connect with me through Facebook or YouTube at bslatewasa. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. And which? <laughs>